What got you there with got you got you? What got you there with Sean Delaney? I'm Sean Delaney, and on this episode of What Got You There, I sit down with one of the world's leading neuroscientists, Antonio Damasio, to talk all about the brain, consciousness, thinking, feeling, knowing, emotions, and everything in between. If you want a master class in what consciousness is and how the brain operates, you're going to love this conversation with neuroscientist Antonio Damasio. Professor Damasio, welcome to What Got You There. How are you doing today? Very well. How about you? I'm doing well. This is going to be one of those really interesting conversations. Um, we're going to get a lot into the brain neuroscience, but I want to start early. And I'm actually really intrigued by what impact reading detective and spy novels had on you early in life. Huh, how interesting. How do you know about that? Um, quite a lot. Uh, I, I, had, uh, I, I read voraciously as, as a kid. And uh, it was very interesting because I, I, my parents wanted me to read very serious things. And I did, I, I have to say. But at the same time, there was this very interesting small library of detective stories. Um, some of them were in English. Some of them were translated in Portuguese, uh, and I was very intrigued. And I was intrigued mainly because they had fantastic covers. They had very beautiful artistic covers by some post-surrealist or surrealist even uh, painters that had done very, very attractive covers. So I was attracted by the covers. And then uh, there were these little books, they were sort of pocket size. And uh, and I started reading them. And, and I remember the first one I read was a a man called Van Dyne, I think. And uh, I was fascinated and I, I, I was intrigued by the mystery. And I, I, th I thought that maybe my part of my inquisitive mind and my desire to arrive at the solution of a problem when we're dealing now with science may have come from that. But of course, it's, uh, it's not necessarily so. It's so interesting, though. I mean, those early experiences, I mean, is that what shaped you, that those curiosities, exploring those, and then trying to solve those big mysteries, those big problems? I, I have to say that it, it, it certainly played a role in my mind. I was intrigued by that. And then I, I think I had read all of the, the books that were available in that series. And there was something about the, the mystery, the, 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 the suspense, um, the, the, the pleasure at arriving at an end, uh, and also the fact that they were relatively short, so one could consume them um, uh, relatively quickly. I, I know you're from Portugal originally. Uh, yeah. You mentioned some, some of the books translated. D does reading in multiple languages, uh, has, has that had any impact for you? I, I don't know if you're able to come to conclusions differently based on the language. I don't, I, I doubt that that is so. I think it certainly doesn't hinder. Uh, you know, being being forced to uh, to confront uh, words for the same thing in different languages is a plus. You know, it, it it helps it helps, for example, realize that 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 language is about tags that you can put on things and on actions, um, but that those vary depending on the cultures in which you are. So. Uh, being being forced to, to confront other languages is, is, is I think, a very interesting uh, um, issue. Uh, and probably, it, 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 I would say it's always positive. I don't see any negatives uh, to it. It certainly doesn't confuse anybody. Uh, and, uh, and I was exposed to that because I, I, I learned languages early, other languages. The, my, my first language, actually, of Portuguese, was French. Uh, I had a vague contact with Spanish because one does hear a little bit of Spanish once in a while in a Portuguese culture, although it's not definitely a main, a main uh, uh, language exposure. Uh, and then I was exposed to, to English through movies um, because it's very interesting in, in a, there was a, a very interesting, and I think very uh, marvelous law in Portugal um, that uh, prohibited the dubbing of movies. You know, in, in Europe, uh, for example, most countries dub movies. So if you go to, uh, I, I don't know about today, and I think still is that way. If you go to uh, an Italian movie house uh, or a French movie house or, or German, you will 
uh, you will watch, for example, an American film that has been dubbed in whatever the local language is. So uh, people in those countries have not been exposed to the sound of other languages, and I was. It was quite marvelous. Uh, so before I knew English from studying English, uh, I knew English from the movies. So I was, I, you know, I, I knew what Humphrey Bogart sounded like, <laughs> or what Ingrid Bergman sounded like in, in English to tell you about people that were from that age. Um, I didn't know what Brad Pitt sounded like because Brad Pitt did not exist. Did not you exist knew he looked like good. You, did, you just didn't know what he sounded like. You look good. So I think b- being exposed to, to, to multiple languages is definitely a plus. And, and I, I'm, 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 I'm very happy with the possibility of, of uh, having some control over more than one language, which, uh, which, which, which I do. Professor Tomasio, have you ever thought about just this this cross disciplinary approach to life? I mean, multiple languages, multiple countries, arts, science, movies, theater, creativity. Uh, I'm just wondering how how you articulate and think about this, being able to analyze your entire life. Um, I think you know it's 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 just uh, uh, well, let's say it's a privilege to begin with, uh, having those multiple exposures, uh, and and it enriches you. Uh, it's very interesting to look at problems from different perspectives and to, to, to look at, for example, some of the problems that I look at today as a scientist, uh, for example, the problem of feeling, which is the, the, one of the main topics of my work and has become more and more so. And I'm talking about feeling, not emotion. Uh, and, and as you know, the, the last book is called Feeling and Knowing precisely because feeling is so important for me. But it's very interesting to look at feeling not as just as a scientist, as I do. I look at it from the perspective of psychology and neuroscience and biology, um, but also look at it from a perspective which would be yours uh, as a person who is not trained in the sciences, I presume you're not, uh, and, and, uh, and is looking at feeling as an experience that you have as a human being, or the experience that people have uh, of, of feeling, for example, being, say, a novelist or a filmmaker or a painter. Um, and it's, it's part, it, it's a, a problem, it's an issue that is part of the life of all those people, um, but they will have different perspectives on it. So uh, I think that different, different perspectives, different points of view, uh, is very essential to enrich your life and to make you understand, uh, for example, other opinions, other mm-hmm. views that people may have about things that you would otherwise consider settled. And very often they're not. What have you done to be able to, to cultivate that muscle, right? Like most people, they have their opinion, their view, and, and they hold on to it with dear life, where, where you're able to really analyze other people's views. It's, it's almost empathy, right? Like you can almost get inside their mind. You even mentioned, Sean, you're, you're not a scientist. I'm going to try to think how you think here. What have you done to be able to develop that? Um, I don't think I've done anything. I think it has just happened. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I don't claim, I don't claim any, any you know, great powers of direction in my life. Uh, I, I, actually, it's a very interesting question that you ask because you're, you're assuming um, as a good sportsman that you are, uh, you're assuming that you can cultivate, you can train something, you can train the, 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 the muscle of empathy. Um, I don't think you, well, at least I don't. Uh, it's just that if things go well, uh, if, if what you're doing is positive and rewarding, um, you probably do more of the same. Uh, and I, I, I really am, I feel that just very fortunate that I have happened into a lot of good things in my life. And I hope that I haven't made too many mistakes in, 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 in throwing away the good parts and ignoring those good parts and just choosing bad things. So it's hey, luck. Hey, professor, one of my favorite things about you is just how humble you are. But oh, I, mean, I, I, I would love to know, I mean, there are few, if any, neuroscientists or people even involved in the brain over the last hundred years who, who have had the impact you had. I mean. There must be something here, right? Like, if you were analyzing, why, why, why you, as as opposed to all these other people? Uh, 
I, I, I don't know. You know, I, I uh, th- that makes me very self-conscious. Yeah, I, got <laughs> I don't. Uh, no, I, I think it would be very present. First of all, I, there, there are plenty of other people that are that produced enormous amounts of good work uh, and have a lot of significance in the science and in in, in, in the, the culture in general. So I, 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 I don't think that that's. Uh, I, I don't want to be too, too, too self-conscious about that. Let, let, let's just say that um, if, if one is reasonably intelligent, one wants to hold on to the good things that have happened in your career, in your life, uh, and to have more of the same. Uh, the, 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 that's a very plain explanation. It doesn't, doesn't require great philosophizing. More of the good. Less of the bad. Uh, you exactly. can continue that on the long, on the long journey. I, you might end up somewhere. So sure. you're, you're very kind to say that that I appear humble. I'm not so sure that I'm humble. If you would be, for example, uh, let's just do a hypothetical. If you would uh, have started this conversation and said, oh, Professor Damasio, I see that you have some interesting ideas here about, uh, about the neuroscience of uh, consciousness. I'm not so sure you're right, you know? And, I would get pretty defensive very quickly, <laughs> and you would see another side of me that is not so humble. <laughs> and I would, I, I would not exactly insult you, but I might turn into into a, a, a nasty guy. <laughs> what well, well, would that be guided based on the amount of years, the amount of work, and the, and the knowledge yeah. and thought that's gone into that? Yeah, I, I think the, the the only thing that get there, there are very few things that actually get me irritated. Uh, I get irritated by lack of respect of anybody in, in general. Uh, I get irritated by stupidity. Um, but I can get irritated if people, uh, for example, have, uh, if, if people disregard the credit of others. For example, if I see somebody claim uh, knowledge or success in a certain area of science, totally disregarding a calling that actually contributed tremendously for that. Uh, that, 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 that really gets me. Um, but it, it's the, it, the, the, those are the things that, uh, that uh, you know, can, can sort of deviate you from a path of being pleasant to yourself and to others uh, and, and trying to be, as you say, humble, you know, which is, it's a good thing to cultivate, but I'm not really humble. No, that, that's, that, 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 that's just a, a facade. Well, I appreciate you open up. So speaking of deviating from the path, um, this is a different type of path, but I know you were originally intrigued by the arts and cinema. How, how did you become interested in, in the brain and the neuroscience? Oh, that, that, that's very easy to, to answer because you see, when you are in the world of the arts and especially in the world of the narrative art, like, like cinema, theater, uh, novels, um, you, you want to really, if the work is good, it's dealing with uh, not only humanity in a very general sense, but with some particular aspect of humanity, which has to do with your mind and how you run your life. So all the good movies that you have had, that you've experienced in your life are about themes that are very interesting. And about all of them, you could start asking questions about why did this happen? Why, what was going on in the mind of a certain character? Uh, how did that come about? And, and the how it ca- came about uh, is something that has been treated historically in the world of philosophy, of course, that, that, that's where it started. Uh, and then in the world of the arts, you know, literature and theater were the first ways of analyzing the human mind uh, in a ways that are sort of pre, pre, pre neuroscientific. Uh, so it was pre psychology and pre neuroscience. Uh, but you know, when you look at Greek theater, uh, when you look at, uh, the, the, I mean, sometimes I like to say one of the greatest uh, um, psychologists, neuroscientists ever was Shakespeare. Hmm. You read the Shakespeare plays and you have. In uh, you can read out the sonnets, but if you read those plays, you you have uh, you have a way of dealing with the mind, the human mind, 
in a tremendous number of very important sort of standard situations, ranging from the, the beautiful and lovely and fun uh, to the situations of tragedy. Uh, what, what you find when, when people betray, when people uh, um, go mad and attack uh, others. Uh, all of that is in Shakespeare. It's really remarkable. Uh, so, you know, Shakespeare, of course, did not go to, to, the, to Oxford University to study uh, neuroscience, uh, um, but he was there and the, the, the structure of the verse, uh, the words that are there, uh, are, are telling immensely important things mm -hmm. about the human mind. So I would put Shakespeare above any, any of the, the people today that are doing science. We're doing interesting things here and there and illuminating certain pockets of, the, of, of this big, great story. But, but what somebody like Shakespeare did is extraordinary. Whether it was Shakespeare himself or somebody with the name of Shakespeare, it doesn't make any difference. Somebody did, and some, there was one person that was able to collect that immense uh, canvas of humanity. How, how do you think about that? Let's just call that ancient wisdom, um, even some, someone like Shakespeare. I mean, I, I think about like the, the wisdom, a uh, big impact on me was the Tao Te Ching and, and Lao Tzu. I'm just trying to think about the, the clarity and understanding they had even thousands of years ago um, yep. that science is, is just proving. What, what, I don't, I, I'm just trying to figure out what to make of that. Well, I, I think that, that we, what science has contributed mainly is a, 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 a way of delimiting a problem, making the problem, sort of containing the problem in a, a smaller way, in, in, in a size that can be illuminated by methods of discovery of the substructure. Um, but all of that ancient wisdom, as, as you call it, uh, was there telling you about the main problems, telling you about the main issues. And what we do in the science today is have uh, ways, sometimes clever, sometimes just you know, banal, of taking a problem and make, putting, putting a sort of square around it so that you can just work on that little part. And then we also have the good luck, thanks to technology, of having a variety of techniques that allow us to get inside that. And you have something that is very important. You have the possibility of quantifying stuff, uh, measuring, comparing, and therefore creating data and uh, dealing with the, 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 the comparisons of data so that you can have not just your opinion, which is very interesting and important and maybe perfect, but you have the possibility of testing whether your opinion is correct or whether you are in fact indulging a fancy that is not correct. And, and that's the beauty of science. And that's of course what Shakespeare didn't have uh, or, or Sophocles. Uh, it, it's the, that possibility of analyzing a part of the problem, trying to quantify it, and then trying to decide uh, with the, the concurrence of others uh, and get some, some kind of agreement that yes, this is likely true or not true because it's not supported by, by the, the data. And that, that really is the, the, the main difference. But, but the old guys uh, were doing the right thing and were the ones that defined the problems for us. Uh, and we, we, we were just doing you know, a little bit of detail. You mentioned the defining the problem using data. Uh, maybe there's a question for later in this conversation. When we get more into into the brain and consciousness, but but I'm wondering, like the, the big decisions in your life, what were you dri driven by? As they say, like the head of the heart. I, I'm wondering for you, so many years studying uh, this. Uh, well, it, it's it's interesting. I would say that many of the decisions, sort of looking back, uh, were, were quite. Uh, quite conscious, quite well thought through, and 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 actually dealt with sort of looking at data in in a, in a very broad sense. Um, but a lot of it has to do with luck, uh, a, a lot of or, or not luck, chance, whatever you want to call it, has to do with encounters that are unpredictable. Uh, 
I, I think it's very difficult. Of course, I'm not going to bore you with it, that analysis, but there are lots of things that happen in my life from the, the people I met, the persons I studied with, uh, what I chose to do that, that really came out of chance. Uh, encountering a person uh, at a meeting, for example, um, that will change your life because you hear that person, you like what the person said, and then you have a chance of talking to that person, and then you have a chance of studying with that person. That, that has happened to me more than once. Uh, and, and I think that the, the idea that one goes through life controlling everything and, and sort of uh, planning your course, I think it's possible. Uh, and, and there are people that probably can work that way. But certainly it did not work that way with me. Uh, there, there's an enormous amount of influence of chance. There, 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 there are things that have happened in my life that are wonderful that uh, came by chance. Yeah, I know from my own experience earlier in my life, where right, it was more about control. It was like, let, let me let me control this scenario. Um, and yeah. it, I, I got to realize so, so many greater things in life when you, when you finally just surrender. Like, let, let, let's see what happens here. Um, exactly. But I, you, you said um, you, you were going to analyze luck, but you didn't want to bore me. I, I would love to just hear you actually articulate that because you, you must have said the word luck five times so far in, in this conversation. But mm. uh, well, let's turn that into luck slash chance there we go uh, uh, and, and yeah no the, 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 of course the, 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 there are things in which you you have to think through for example if you're offered a position uh, at say a, a university uh this has happened to me lots of times and you you actually have uh, objective uh, facts that you can deal with it's a what are the people that you would work with what are the people that would be your colleagues uh, what is the status of a certain institution? Uh, they, or, or if people ask you to be uh, on the board of some uh, foundation, uh, you, you can analyze the, 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 the facts. That, that is not chance. That, that is uh, sort of some, some kind of wisdom, uh, uh, wisdom of manipulating, of manipulating the data. Uh, it, it's, not, it's not science either. It, it just, and you should not, you should not take it hyper seriously. Uh, I think that sometimes people, especially when they get older, which is my case, uh, people sort of get very reflective and uh, and they want to to sort of rewrite their own histories and put everything in a in a great big scheme. You know, there's a, this path that I follow, and I, I I I think maybe in some cases that's true. I think mostly that's fiction. <laughs> it's like writing your own novel so that others can read it uh, um, on the fly. I've got to catch myself here because I could literally spend my entire day talking about, about your background. So I, I, I'm going to catch myself, but I'm, I just got to ask one more thing, just thinking about luck um, and, and risk, essentially, I guess. It, your decision in 1990, you changed the course of what you guys were doing in your lab, correct? And I'm just wondering what led to that decision? and why, why you were willing so to go against the grain. I'm just intrigued by how all this comes into play in a scenario like that. Um, yeah, well, again, it, it's, there it's the power, uh, the, the, there's an aspect of affect there that is very interesting. It's interesting because those decisions have a lot to do with affect to begin with, but affect is also the reason. So it, it's something that urges you to do, to do to follow a certain path. Uh, so not, things are not all equal. And by the way, that's one of the, the, the great themes of my work now when I, when I think about it uh, is, is the differentiation that happens uh, when you look at facts because all facts with normal individuals come affected by a certain quality it's not just about quantities. You know, for example, I, I, I love the, the, the achievements of artificial intelligence, but one thing that people very often don't understand is that artificial intelligence is an incredible um, instrument that deals very nicely with uh, things that are measurable, with things that can be exactly measured 
as quantities. And that's why um, you know, it's wonderful to have, to have artificial intelligence to help you, for example, guide a 747 into a fog-bound runway. Uh, and it will land precisely where uh, the, the, the program wants it much better than the pilot could. Um, but if you want to have a human judgment, if you want uh, me to decide did that person, uh, did that person intend to commit a crime or not? Uh, and when I go through the analysis of the facts and the testimonies in court, and when you try to put together an idea of whether that person did wrong or not, or what should be the punishment for a person that actually did wrong, then that you're starting to deal with things that have to do with feelings, with affect, and that has to do with qualities more than quantities. And that's where the big problem starts. So uh, uh, drifting, making this distinction between what is easily quantifiable and what is not easily quantifiable, and then in fact may never be quantifiable because it's in the form of a, of a quality that moves with the vagaries of life. That's a very big, important problem. That's, by the way, something that I try to address in a very simple, calm way in feeling and knowing, um, because it's, it's just to give an idea uh, to people that, that feeling is about a, a, an ongoing interactive representation with the state of your life in your body. And that, by nature, varies. You know, the, the, the state you are in right now, the state I'm in, is not exactly the same that it was um, 20 minutes ago when we started our conversation. Uh, if that was 20 minutes ago, I'm venturing. Um, so, and that's because of the way life is. That's because life is constantly moving and waving in different, in, in, in different rhythms. It's like music. Do you like music? I love music. Yeah. Do, 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 you, do you, what do you listen to? So, I'm going to eat. yeah, no, 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 I'm no. Good. This is a great song. I, I, it, d depending on, on what I'm doing. Um, so, I actually, uh, I'll listen to a bunch of classical if I'm actually reading or studying. Um, and then a lot of times at dinner, my wife and I were, were big jazz fans. So, I, we okay. listen to a lot of jazz in the house. Okay, good. Very good. So, so I'm, I, I think this actually but, might. But, but you see, but, but music. The reason why I ask you this is because music expresses very well um, this kind of uh, this kind of qualitating uh, uh, vagary of uh, of life. Hmm. Go ahead. I interrupted you. No, 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 no. I I think it would just actually it would be helpful for for people to understand the difference between feeling and emotion um, because yeah. I I don't want people to lump these two together um, when they're, when they're clearly different. Good, good for you. So uh, with the, the big difference is that emotion, as the name indicates, is about action. It's, it's something that you can actually see. When you see somebody uh, happy, when you see somebody crying, uh, you see an action. There's theater there. there there's a mask, there are movements, uh, and, and the movements that are directed to the outside. Actually, the very root of emotion, it's actually that is motion directed to the outside. Uh, so it's, it's something that is visible, it's objectifiable, you can, can make a videotape of it, you can record sounds, you can do all of that. Um, but feeling is all interior, feeling is about experience. So when you feel hungry, of course you can, you can have aspects of your body that signify to others that you're hungry. But when you feel hunger or thirst or pain, you're actually having an experience which is in your mind and which is telling you something about your body. So feeling is about experience. It is necessarily subjective. It's your own, it's private. Emotion is public, is, is something that is action directed to the outside world. So you couldn't have it more different. Uh, and, and yet these two things are constantly con confused and people are constantly talking about emotion and feeling and vice versa, which is one great big salad. Uh, and, uh, and we need to make this distinction because feelings are very uh, primordial. You know, it's through feeling 
that we entered the world of consciousness. Feelings are the, the, the clear inaugural examples of being conscious. The first time that any creature, not human necessarily, felt pain, that feeling was conscious by itself. If, if it were not conscious, the creature would not have felt it. The creature would not have known. So the beauty of feeling is that it is automatically necessarily conscious. It's the beginning of this great big phenomenon in the history of life. And it is giving you knowledge. It's giving you, especially for us now that have a complicated mind and brain helping it, it, it's giving us very precise knowledge about what is going on in your life. And you can act on it. And so the, the, the great beauty is that when you think about uh, creatures that are very complicated, but at the same time, very simple by comparison to us, like say bacteria, um, you know, they don't even have a, a nucleus, they're, they're simple organisms, but guess what? They have a body. They need to have energy sources to nourish themselves and to, to go through the, the days of their life that are prescribed in their genome. Uh, they need to be in a good part of whatever territory they're in so that they can get food. They cannot be in a place that is too cold or too, too hot because the, their bodies may be destroyed. And what they're doing is to navigate, quote unquote, the, the, their universe to be in the place that is most convenient to maintain their lives which is of course a great issue of homeostasis. They are governing homeostasis, but let's be careful. They're doing all this very intelligently, but without knowing they're doing it. That's the great beauty here in these distinctions is that bacteria and many other simple creatures are intelligent, but the intelligence is, is covert. There's, they don't know that they're intelligent. They don't know what they're doing. And yes, they do, yet they do it. Whereas we and many other creatures, complex creatures before us, because we have the possibility of, through a nervous system, having the possibility of feeling, having the possibility of mapping out the world around us, we have the possibility of doing things about our life that we know we are doing. So when you have pain, you have the possibility of withdrawing from what caused pain in you. And if you're hung, uh, hungry, you can go and eat food. And if you're thirsty, you can drink. And if you have desire, you can uh, act on your desires, you know, all things being equal <laughs> and with some caution, <laughs> given the laws. Uh, but other, other than that, you can do all that. So uh, feeling is the, is, is the great, uh, fantastic entry into the world of consciousness and into the world of knowing, uh, which is, of course, what makes the big difference between uh, our own self-governance and the non-self-governance of creatures that don't have this, this beautiful apparatus. This is absolutely fascinating. This has me thinking, in, in recent years, a lot of talk with the, with the gut brain, right? Like it's, they yeah. call it the second brain, but you're saying feeling with first. So essentially, when the the gut, that brain, have been our first brain? Yeah. W yes. I mean, the, 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 a lot of the things that, you see, we are, we, we're really a compound of many, uh, of many organisms, of course, and, and we have lots of things in our organism that work exactly the way bacteria do. They do their own work and they don't need us to interfere. Mm -hmm. And there are things in our, in our gut that do precisely that. They're contributing to the general economy, um, but they themselves, uh, the cells say in the gut uh, and the neural cells that are in tantum with those cells in intestine, uh, they do not know what they're doing. Uh, they, are, they are working covertly just like bacteria and other simple organisms can, can do. Uh, now, all of this is contributing knowledge about the general state of the living organism. And that, because we have 
uh, great um, brain structures that can put together that information and map it, then you have the possibility of feeling and the possibility of knowing about them. But it's, it's really, a, a, you know, we are, of course, a, 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 a collection of organisms that has been developed through evolution, and we, we were this conglomerate, you know, and, and because of that, we have all these possibilities, but, uh, but it's, uh, it's made up of many parts that are far less intelligent than mm -hmm. we are. To form a greater good. Uh, how, how do you define it's, consciousness? Um, well, the, 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 the possibility of knowing, well, the, the, something is very important. When you, when you talk about consciousness, you have to, uh, the most important thing probably is to say that it has to do with experience. Consciousness is what allows you, first of all, it's in your mind. It's not something that you see outside. Again, think it's on the side of feeling for one good reason, it came from feeling. Uh, so it's something that is internal and it's something that is in your mind and it's something that is allowing you to be a subject, to be a self. Uh, and to have experiences. When you have one way of saying, when you have pain or when you have well being, one way of describing that is to say, you are having the experience of well being. So there is a you, there is yourself. Uh, you know, I, I wrote some years ago a, a book called Self Comes to Mind, the idea that once in this mind structure, once you have the possibility of referring to yourself, referring to your own organism, then you're entering the, the world of consciousness. But it, it, it is a, the best way of saying it in a simple way is, is consciousness is about knowledge of the state of your organism. Uh, it, it's experienced internally by a self. So your organism becomes the rally point of the knowledge. Uh, and then as we have this possibility of mapping out the external world through vision and hearing and touching and smelling and so forth, you have the possibility of referring all of that world to the world of your organism. Okay. But, so the, the, the big thing here is to separate feeling and it's immediate entry into consciousness uh, because it has to do with building yourself, building your own organism, which refers to your body and only to your body. And then the world that is outside, which our nervous system is collecting through the eyes, the ears and so forth, which then ends up being referred to that world within. That's what gives you the possibility of consciousness. Now, if you would take away the feeling, if you would take away the feeling, you would remove the possibility of self. And then you, you could have all the, the images in the world around you, um, but they would not mean anything because they would not be referred to you. So you, you, and, and it's very interesting for you to think about this and for your viewers and listeners, is that most of the time when people think about consciousness, they are attracted by this great big show around us. So the, 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 the landscapes, the, the landscape that I have in front of me, your, like your, your room, your face, uh, or the sounds of music, all of this is a spectacular production, very Hollywood style production. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet that would not mean anything if you would not have the other production which comes from within and which is the possibility of feeling yourself telling you, hey, if you feel this, you're here. You know, it's not a syllogism that you very often go through, but the, the fact that you feel your existence, that you feel yourself good or not so good is the anchor to everything that is going on around you. Nothing makes any sense unless you have that core self that which is based on your living organism right now, and which disappears the minute you die. Because, of course, if you die, if the whole thing is suspended, or if you lose consciousness, by the way, which really is a way, you know, again, 
people very often think about losing consciousness as something has to do with losing the picture of the world. Well, it is that too. But what you lost first was the picture of your inside. Just think of this. Why do, why do you want to have anesthesia when you're having surgery? You, you want, want to feel have, the pain? Exactly. You want to have anesthesia so that the surgeon can cut your flesh without you starting screaming and attacking the surgeon. So what, what anesthesia produces first and foremost is the, the, the suspension of yourself, the suspension of the possibility of feeling, which is the anchor to everything that's around you. And mm -hmm. so they give you the, the anesthetic, they inject it, and there you go. In one split second, you go from being to not being. And you're gone. And then the surgeon can do what he wants. This might be a completely out there question, but I remember reading, it might have been in nature, it, around global consciousness. And hours prior to 9-11, like there were spikes in global consciousness. I, I could just be asking a horrible question here, but I'm just wondering, like, what's your take on global consciousness? Uh, I don't know what it is. It, it's, a, it's essentially like there's a collected consciousness amongst the world. Yeah, okay. yes, I mean, that, that stands to reason from, from that definition, but is the idea that, that, that there was a global awareness that something was going to happen? No. Yeah, essentially, I, I, I am a novice in this, so I don't want to try to pretend like I know more than I do. Um, essentially, there were massive spikes in terms of global, like, sadness and depression just hours before um, the attack. Same thing happened, actually, leading up to, to COVID, um, when, that, when that first really released. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Uh, well, uh, I'm, I'm not going to say that that's impossible because I, have, I haven't seen what the data are. My, my question would be, uh, if in order for me to be convinced that that's the case, uh, you would have to prove that on, on other occasions, that kind of phenomenon has not happened. Mm -hmm. Because okay. My, my suspicion is that, yes, it could coincide uh, because th there must be periods in which for a variety of reasons, people have spikes of uh, sadness and, and, and uh, trouble and so forth. I think right now we're having something like that. For example, what, what has happened, uh, the kind of conflict that social media um, so often induces uh, is leading to uh, uh, clearly a conflict that you see in societies. You see it in our society quite clearly, but you see it in, in other societies throughout the world. Uh, there, 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 there are situations that cause conflict and then there are mechanisms of distribution of information uh, and dealing with information that may enhance the conflict. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I would, uh, are we to expect another 9-11 because of this? Yeah. I hope not. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm open to, to seeing, seeing the data, but I, I'm not, it's not something that I find likely, let's put it this way. I think there must be waves up and down happening of, of that sort of global uh, um, sort of increase of certain effective states, but that doesn't mean that that, that is the precursor to a horrible event. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate you even, even enter, entertaining that and uh, exploring that with me there. Well, one thing I, I'm always so intrigued by is, is interoception. And please fill in any gaps here, but it's essentially like the perception of senses inside the body uh, like yeah. related to emotion. And I, I, oh, I always think about, so there's a, a legendary investor, his name is George Soros. And he used to talk about this, this legendary back pain he would get um, when, when he, he just felt something within his portfolio. And he was essentially, yeah. whenever that happened, he was essentially right every single time. I, I would just love to know like, you study this so much. I, I, I would love to use it wrong with that. I just want to know. <laughs> good. I think that, that, that's actually a very, very good example. Um, uh, first, the, the interception, as you said, it's about um, perceiving the interior. What's very interesting is that th th there is another, th the other word that you need to have, uh, at least one other, uh, next to interception is extraception. And extraception is about perceiving the outside. So, for example, when I'm perceiving you on the, on the screen of my iPad, um, I am doing extra visual extraception. And when I hear your voice, I'm having sound 
extraception. So interception, and by the way, there's also, since you're uh, an athlete, uh, there's also proprioception. Proprioception is about the perception of the state of your muscular, muscular and skeletal frame. And so, the, the, and it's quite interesting because it's very distinct. The, the neuroscience of proprioception and of extraception are completely different worlds. Interception is about the perception of the interior. And the interior means not the muscles, not the bones, but all the other stuff. The, the thick of your skin, the, uh, the heart, the lungs, the, 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 the circulation of the blood, all of the flesh that is inside you, except for the muscles and, and, and the bones, of course. Uh, so interception is about that. The interesting issue, though, is that interception is unique in the fact, in, in the sense that you perceive with the nervous system what is going on in the body, but it so happens that the nervous system is inside the body. So we're talking about a perfectly incestuous relationship. And that incestuous relationship leads to something unique, is that the brain that perceives the body and the body that is perceived interact, which really means that the word perception does not really apply. What you have in interception is a literal fusion of body and nervous system. The, the, the nerve terminals that go into every nook and cranny of your body are mingling and commingling with your flesh. And of course, when I'm looking at you on my screen, I am not mingling with you. I, um, I would not be mingling with you if I were in the same room and I'm not mingling <laughs> with you because you're an image. You're being created in, through my retinas and going on into my visual cortex, but you're, you live in a separate world from the world of my body. Now, if I now have a, a pain um, for some reason in my body, that pain is inside my body. That pain is actually generated by this interaction between nervous system and my living organism. And so it produces something very different. And, but it, it's interesting because historically, uh, uh, interception began as a sort of perception of the interior. And right now, as I explained in feeling and knowing, we shouldn't really say that. It's, it's a, a much more complicated process. It's really the interactive process of body and nervous system. And so what George Soros, that's very interesting. George Soros is a, a, a remarkable uh, man, by the way. I, I know him and he's he, br absolutely brilliant. Uh, very, very thoughtful and very, uh, uh, I, I haven't heard that story. You'll have to ask him next time. I will I have to ask him. Uh, but it, it's, uh, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not surprised that he has that kind of uh, attention and in, in, intuition um, based on that attention to a pain that he would have. It's interesting. So, so, so can you actually cultivate that? Oh, yes, that, 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 that you can. I think you can, you can pay attention to what you intuit correctly. So if you, so it's, it's really a question of paying attention to how having a particular thought and being in a particular situation uh, is associated or not with success in the things you're supposed to do in your life. Yeah, I, th I think you can cultivate that. That's actually something that I probably do not very, uh, not in a determined way, but I think I probably do it automatically. What do you mean by, by that? The way, I, I mean that that I I probably uh, uh, want to um, to believe sometimes that certain configurations of uh, uh, a relationship or events can lead to more success uh, or less success in something you're trying to do. But of course, be aware of the fact that that's also the source of superstition. So if you pay too much attention to it, and if that's the way you're going to guide your life, then you become a superstitious person. Um, so you could say that, that that back pain is almost like superstition. It's a, a good superstition or bad, I don't know, depending on, on how 
uh, Soros used it, but but it, it that's the best for superstition. So you have to be careful. Yeah, do, do it. <laughs> I'm sure that's a fine line. I, I'm assuming a lot of people are wondering, like, th does meditation help cultivate this? I think meditation helps cultivate clarity of thought. Uh, meditation can get you rid of a lot of stuff that uh, is unnecessary and that is bothering you and shouldn't uh, and and so it can make things more clear meditation is really about making people observe with some calm what's going on in their lives instead of having this jumble that we have because we have too much to do mm -hmm. uh, most of them and we, we're being we're being solicited too much to do things and very often we don't need to do things although it's very nice to talk to you which is very nice for soliciting. Speaking about just like getting clear and clarity on things, you had a great line in the book. I just want to highlight because one of the things you do extremely well actually is take these unbelievably complicated things and distill them down. Um, and, and the line you had in the book is do what good poets and sculptors do so well, chip away at the non-essential and then chip some more. I just I just love that. Is, is this something that like you've done your whole life? Because the books, it's, it's remarkable how you are able to chip away so much. Um. No, I don't think I've done that my, my whole life. I, 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 but, I, but I did that in relation to, to, to this book, which is something I wanted to do to see how it would work. And uh, it was actually very, very influenced by a request from my editor. It's an editor that I've worked with for, for many years. And he said, you know, several times he had told me this, you have to, to, do, uh, um, to write a book that is very simple, very very direct. Get rid of all the all the the the, the things that are unnecessary to explain to, to, to explain your story. Uh, and, uh, uh, and and he said, don't don't do reference, just to, just like poetry. Uh, and I said, well, I don't think I can do that. Uh, and I, I didn't actually. We had a we had a, a, a disagreement about about uh, references and notes. He did not want me to have any notes. I said, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, the, but I did chip away a lot. So I, I did practice a little bit of a, a haiku uh, in, in relation, to, the, in relation to, to this book. And sometimes, um, the, the, the other day, I was, uh, you know, I was um, actually preparing for, for an interview uh, and that was about the, the French edition of the book. And I was reading the book, just in case. And I was on a plane with my wife next to me. I was reading that and then I turned to her and said, you know, this is actually very well written. This is a good book. <laughs> and I, which, a good I normally, test. <laughs> uh, yeah, which I normally don't have because normally I, when I, when I have a, uh, an article here that was written just about two, three weeks ago, and I, the, the first three pages are just filled with, with uh, uh, corrections, and I don't like it anymore. Uh, and, and normally I'm, I'm awful, and, I, and I, 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 I have 10 versions of the same text and so forth. But with this one, I actually liked it, which is a good sign or a bad sign. Yeah, right. <laughs> very very good point there. I'm getting, <laughs> that, I'm getting, that I'm getting less critical. <laughs> well, speaking of hacking away the non-essential, like one of the things I'm just so fascinated is they say, and please correct me if I'm wrong here, that the unconscious essentially every second takes in about 11 billion or 11 million bits of data through, through all of our senses, but we're only processing between like 40 and 60 of them. I don't, it, it, first off, is this correct? And then like, what, what am I to make of this? What, what's happening with those 11 other million bits? Yeah, well, probably nothing. I mean, it's going to go into your unconscious. To some degree, no. I, I, I think that you know, I don't know about the numbers. The, the, those numbers need to be taken, you know, tongue in cheek. Uh, depends on how you measure the, those things. But there, there's no doubt that we are, we 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 deal with relatively small portions of what we bring in from the world. There's so many things that we are that we are perceiving but not really attending to. Uh, and the, 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 the world is so, so rich. Uh, and, and you're constantly being distracted. For example, even if I'm talking to you and what you're asking me is very interesting and I'm thinking not only about your question, but what I'm thinking about, 
but I've been distracted by several things on your wall. For example, there's one picture uh, on the left-hand side uh, with, with a black frame, uh, which is some kind of drawing. And throughout our conversation, I have been gradually imagining that that drawing is a drawing of Matisse. How did I do that? Um, if it is a Matisse, my congratulations. In case it is not a Matisse. I, I wish I had an authentic Matisse back there. Yeah, but, <laughs> but I don't actually see the detail of it, but there's something about the, the, the lines that made me think of a Matisse drawing. And I, I'm not actually seeing the lines. So obviously, all of this is being computed by me. Uh, and I, I honed in on that because again, it, it sort of um, rhymes with some of my interests. And I didn't, uh, you know, I also see some horses on, on the background and they did not attract as much attention as the frame with the potential Matisse. Uh, well, so it, it's an incredible wealth of things that you have in your mind. So is it true that we have more in our minds that we can chew? You bet, true. Uh, where does that go? Probably into waste or it goes into this vast uh, unconscious uh, processes and it may surface. Uh, certainly our dear, our dear old Sigmund would, uh, would say that it surfaces when you least expect it in some tricky form. Well, I, I, that, I guess that's why I'm so intrigued. Like, is this actually going to waste or would there be a way to tap more into those, those let's call them 11 million bits so we could? Um, yeah. I, th I think that, that, that there, may be, there may be ways. And that, of course, a, a psychoanalyst would tell you, well, there are ways you would just go through your analysis and pay the big bucks and you will know what's in your unconscious. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm being facetious, but I think that actually that's a way of getting into the unconscious for sure. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I think that what one should do is worry about the things that you are conscious of and try to make sure that they harmonize, that they are connected with the things that you want to do and that are part of your general plan of life. It gets back to music, the harmonizing, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. There's, yeah. there's a great it, research paper that might intrigue you. And it was something around Nobel laureates. I think it was something like 22 times more likely to play a musical instrument uh, than their counterparts that didn't receive it. It's something about that that the, yeah. the beauty and creativity that comes from that. I, I think that the, the uh, that, that, that's very interesting. I didn't know that, that, that fact, but um, I, I think the, the ability, the, the, the sensibility that allows you to tap into the arts is useful in the sciences. Uh, the same way that knowing about the sciences would not be hurtful to an artist, I, I don't think that that uh, the, the, this idea that you would be a greater artist if you would be in a state of complete uh, um, lack of knowledge about the world, disregarding science and math and so forth. I, I, I think that's not true. Uh, it may be that some people are helped by their ignorance, um, but I'm not convinced. Uh, I think that in general, you find that great artists either through knowledge that they acquired or through an incredible intelligence, um, very intuitive, actually know a lot about the world they're dealing with. I don't think that artists can be great artists without having uh, um, considerable intelligence and considerable knowledge of the world. And of course it differs if you're, uh, not all arts demand as much, um, but, uh, but, but I think this applies, and this applies uh, to, to music as well. And of course, there, th that knowledge would, would find a way into the music composition uh, through non-conscious means, uh, for sure. Well, I mean, look, look at da Vinci, right? Like the, the amount he yeah. studied the sciences to, to understand lighting, skin, everything like that. I, I'm fascinated yeah. by da Vinci, so I like this yeah. example. <laughs> Yeah, and it is a good person to be fascinated by. Yeah, quite, quite, quite a remarkable, quite a remarkable mind. 
well, speaking of remarkable minds, uh, I feel bad an hour to distill down uh, one of the greatest minds here in neuroscience in history. I'm wondering because I, re I really did enjoy the book, Feeling and Knowing. I want to know, like, what else, um, any other big things you just want the, the listeners to, to understand or walk away from? Because um, I hope based on this conversation, they're very intrigued and are very interested in picking up the book. Well, uh, I, I, first of all, thank you for, for, for talking to me. It was very interesting. It was a terrific uh, conversation. That's the first thing. Uh, I think that the, take, take this book as something uh, intermediate. In, what, what I, what I uh, and, and again, we go to the idea of the haiku. The fact that, that it is pared down doesn't mean that it is superficial. Uh, on the contrary, because once you have the possibility of honing in on just one particular idea and chip away at it, you actually have the possibility of going deeper. Mm -hmm. that, that's the first. And then in this book, in spite of the fact that I mean, it's the, the, the shortest book I ever wrote, normally my, my books are at least 150 pages longer than this one. Um, but it doesn't mean that there are not things there that you've never heard. And so there are in fact things there in terms of my commitment to feeling as a source of consciousness that go deeper than my previous books. And the last thing I would say to my potential uh, readers uh, is that uh, in a way, I'm happy that it's there, but I'm already beyond it. <laughs> and uh, what I'm looking for is the, you know, like for example, this year, there were already uh, two, three papers that I have published with colleagues of mine that go beyond what's in the book. And that's, you know, one source of satisfaction in the middle of COVID and all the other uh, terrible nonsense that we're dealing with in our world. Uh, it's nice to know that, that somehow you're making progress. And, uh, and sooner or later that progress that is, is appearing in the form of scientific papers, I hope will appear in the form of a book. So that's my message to the readers. Read this one, hope for the next one. We're, we're always learning more, right? We're always uncovering more. I'm actually, you speak of that, like what's driving you? Like what's at the core? Um, uh, I don't know if I can answer that. You know, it, it, it's, it's, I wake up in the morning and I, I, I want to, you know, I, I've now taken to doing something that I've never done in my life. I've never kept a diary, which I regret because there will be incredibly interesting things of my life in terms of the people I've encountered, uh, which I've been incredibly lucky to encounter so many people that I find fascinating. Some people that I wanted to meet and did, and some people that I met by chance. Um, but now I, I'm doing something, not, I don't want to call it a diary, but in a lot of the times, uh, a lot of days, I have, sorry. I hope I stopped it, I forgot. Um, so the, the and, and what, I'm, what I'm finding now is that I end up a day, and if I write something at night, I very often write about exciting things that are making me wake up and continue that idea, which happened, for example, in relation to last night and this morning. So that's something that obviously drives me. But, but, but then these other sort of more conventional things like you want to know, you want, you want to have the answer to certain questions and then they're nagging you and you want to go after them. What's the one, the most nagging one? I, there, there's not a most nagging one. <laughs> could, you, could, could you entertain not, me, even, even one that's just kind of sitting up there? No, it, it, I can tell you that it has a lot to do with what we've been talking about, with feeling. Uh, it, it, that, that's the, the, the smaller part of the question, but that has a lot to do with it. Terrific. Sean, this has been a wonderful conversation. This has been, do you mind if we do two really quick ones? The, I'm just... Please. Two final ones. So uh, I know how much you you love music and art. Is, is there a piece? It, it could be music or art or even a performance you've seen that has just moved you. That, that you just you saw it and you can never get it out of your mind. Anything like that? 
Oh, yes, many, many, my God. It, it, uh, not many, we're not talk, talking about thousands, but hundreds easily, easily. And, and there, are, there are pieces of music that are indispensable to, to, to me and that I can listen to uh, tons of times uh, and be, and be um, always, um, always find new things. Mm. I've been listening actually in the, in the past few days to uh, uh, interpretations of uh, Bach um, piano partitas. Uh, and there's one, one uh, uh, new recording by a man called Piotr Andrzejewski, who's a great uh, pianist, is uh, Polish, Hungarian, and French. Um, and it's interesting because the, I always thought that, uh, especially the, 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 the partita number one, the, 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 the best interpretation was by a Portuguese pianist, a wonderful, uh, brilliant, a woman pianist, Maria João Pires. She's wonderful, she's a contemporary of mine, uh, and she's an absolutely incredible pianist. She's very, she's adored by legions of people, uh, especially in Europe. She doesn't come to the United States often, which is a pity. Um, at any rate, I thought her interpretation was the best, and, and I still think it's fantastic. But this new interpretation that I've discovered has new things about the way the, the music is presented and it's incredibly captivating, not only in the sound itself, but even in the, in the length of the pauses between the different movements. So that, 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 that's, something that, that's something I look forward to in my life is having those experiences mm. uh, or, or the experiences that one has with certain visual artists or with certain uh, actors that you see um, presenting a, a, a play. Um, so all, all, all of these are, are very, are very important and very nourishing. Well, music but, is the space between the notes, right? F final one. I, I, I know your friends and have gotten to talk with a lot of people. Is, is there anyone you haven't gotten to talk to, dead or alive, that you would just love to have a, just an evening, just full of conversation with? Dead or alive? Oh my God. Uh, Dead, I would want to talk to Shakespeare. Hmm. And, and, and that Da Vinci would not be far behind. Yeah. We could line them up. Yeah. Um, the um, alive, uh, I'm not going to say because there, 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 there are several people. It would be too, too long a list. Yeah. Well, I think. Professor Damasio, this, this really is a true honor for me. I can't thank you enough. Um, enjoy you, your work, your, your, your thinking. So I just can't thank you enough for coming on. What got you there? Very good. Thanks so much, Sean. I really enjoyed our conversation. And believe Maybe me, we're going to have everything linked up uh, in, in the show notes and the transcript uh, with, with your new book and the previous books. So once again, thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you. Have a good day. Sean, the lady.